Okay, let's, um, let's see what happens. Yeah. Hi, I'm Edwin Rich, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm pleased to uh, be here with Sarah Lloyd Hughes. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for joining me for this discussion. Um, so, I wanted to uh, first uh, introduce you, and um, you're a founder of Ginger Training and Coaching, and you're a popular speaker on confidence and inspiration, and an award winning social entrepreneur. And you have a uh, you're the author of a book, and I actually have it here that I can show on the screen, uh, which I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, and there it is, uh, how, to, how to Be Brilliant at Public Speaking. Uh, uh, and that's for any audience, any situation. And um, you're located in the uh, UK, and is there anything else by way of introduction that you'd like to uh, share? Uh, well, that's a great introduction. Thanks, Edwin. Lovely to, to meet you. Um, I've also been featured as, as a TEDx speaker, and um, my, my passion, I suppose, is to ask the question, how can we be more powerful as public speakers, um, and more specifically, how can we inspire people with the words that we use, um, both in public speaking and also in, in um, everyday situations? Oh, great. Well, let me just show uh, your website, too. It's uh, gingerpublicspeaking.com. And uh, that's actually is showing, I, th I hope you're able to see that, it's actually showing the article you wrote, uh, Inspire Through Empathy, and that was uh, part one. And mm -hmm. that's how I, I got connected to you. Is, uh, you know, I've, uh, dealing in terms of, you're, you're, you're writing about public speaking, I've always been bad at public speaking. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, good job, <laughs> <laughs> And I thought that, uh, oh wow, here it is, empathy and public speaking. <laughs> and they're together, I definitely have to talk to you. So, um, would you like to uh, share a little bit about uh, you know your yeah. article? Yeah, I mean, um, just to give a little bit of context um, about where empathy as a as a term came from. Um, so, I've been doing this work for some years now, and and um, public speaking always uh, was something that I struggled with as well. And so, you're, you're not alone. I, I was terrified <laughs> in it when I first started, and. Um, all the time people were trying to tell me that there was almost a checklist of things that you needed to do as a, as a speaker. You know, you were supposed to put your hands in a certain way and use certain buzzword phrases and, and follow a very defined structure. And I was finding that that was making me more nervous rather than more natural as a speaker. Um, and I also realized that it wasn't, it wasn't true, 100% at least. Um, when I look at speakers who move me, speakers who I connect with, ones who I consider to be inspiring, I notice that it's not that they follow a set pattern of, of rules and behaviors, it's not that they all say the same thing, in fact, often they're very different to each other. And so I, um, in the investigation that, that led me to write um, How to Be Brilliant at Public Speaking, started asking myself, well, if it's not them following a certain formula, what is it? You know, what are these people who can move an audience doing? Um, and I identified six qualities of an inspiring speaker, uh, one of which is empathy. And probably uh, it's also useful background to know that I'm a practicing Buddhist, um, and, and this then connects directly towards empathy. For, for me, it came from the term uh, compassion, which um, is a very uh, central premise of Buddhism that you um, think more of others than you do of yourself and I was finding that actually this um, this area is revolutionary for people when they're thinking about their public speaking nerves. So yeah. Should I just keep talking? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, so what I'm hearing is that there's uh, the uh, with the uh, Buddhism that that Buddhism led you to empathy and uh, you know and that the uh, some that you started off, which is kind of how I do it too, I get very structured. I think, oh, I have to have a really fixed structure, and the structure itself becomes somewhat intimidating. I feel kind of rigid within that structure, which makes me very self-conscious. And yeah. so I'm hearing that there's another way instead of being very structured. And Yeah, yeah, there is another way, and, and that way relies on um, qualities that we have inside us, you know, these six qualities of an inspiring speaker are not something external to us, they're not something that, that we don't have already, because if they were, then how would we actually develop them, you know, if they were so external to us, we wouldn't ever really be able to integrate them. Um, 
So my understanding of, of, of really inspiring public speaking, really brilliant public speaking, is that you might look very different um, as, as, a, as one type of speaker versus another type. But the thing that all of those inspiring speakers have in common, or one of the six things that they have in common, is empathy. So maybe I'll say a little bit more about, about what that means. It's also mm -hmm. got an important relationship to um, battling those nerves. You know, and, and um, just last week, um, a survey came out uh, in, in the UK about women's biggest fear. And public speaking came third on the list. Uh, I, I, these sorts of surveys get thrown around quite a lot, and I've never actually seen one that had um, numbers of people who had been surveyed. There was always this idea that public speaking was a big fear amongst people, but nobody had ever really proven it since the 70s. So um, it was nice to see that that someone had actually gone ahead and done the work. <laughs> so top in the top three fears that people face, and and why. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons is because we fail to appreciate something fundamental about public speaking. You know, when we step on stage, we imagine that it's all about us. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems very obvious that it's all about us because we're the one who's standing on stage. We're the one who is um, the expert or the person with the ideas. Um, we're the one who all the people are looking at. All um, the eyes the are on you, are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the one's name is on the bill. So it makes sense. Surely, therefore, it must be about us. And this is the mistake that we make because we get completely egocentric. We imagine that because people are looking at us, it must be about us. And um, that means that we're forgetting about um, the, the majority of people in the room. We're forgetting about the audience. So on a basic level, the quality of empathy in terms of public speaking starts with a bit of math. It starts with, or math as you call it in the States, <laughs> the added S for, for Britishness. If you, if you add up how many speakers are there in the room at any one moment, how many do you think there are, Edwin, normally? How, how many speakers at any one yeah. moment? Usually there's one speaker normally speaking there's one at one speaker. time. What's that? Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. Math mathematical genius. <laughs> and how many how many audience members are there normally? Um, well, as many as, as people are, there are. Is, I would say is there's. Uh, well, what can we say for certain? Uh, well, there's. Uh, I guess there's one the speaker. <laughs> Maybe the speaker is their own audience too. Yeah, there's there's at least one, and normally there's at least more than one. Otherwise, it's it's a conversation rather than a piece of public oh, speaking. Oh, that's true. So, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, let's hope. Let's hope that if we're doing public speaking, that there's more than one person in the room. Otherwise, we might as well you know, leave. Um, so, we if we do that piece of maths, we can ask ourselves, well, what's more important, one person or many people in a room? And and of course, even if we're doing a hangout like this with with uh, apparently one to one. We also are aware that we have an audience and that what we're saying, what we're discussing, um, we can either focus on how I'm feeling as, as the speaker or how you're feeling as the interviewer, uh, uh -huh. or we could start to realize that there's more people that, that we should care about. So if we realize that there's more people that we can, can think of, we start to focus our attention somewhere other than ourselves. And here we can shift our mindset from being very egocentric and like all the arrows and all the attention pointing at us and we can turn the arrows around and say, look, it's not about me here. It's not about me because it's not. It's about the audience. And if you think about this, because often people are like, yes, OK, Sarah, I'm not sure about that. If you think about it, if you just cast your mind back to the last time you were in an audience and get aware of what it was you were focusing on, yes, you might have been focused on the speaker and you might have been thinking to yourself, ah, oh, you know, they, they seem nervous or they seem confident or they have interesting material. But it would always come back to, I think, um, it would always come back to me, the audience member, relating to the speaker. So what can I get from that speaker? What, what can I learn? How can I feel better from what they're saying? So actually, our audience are sitting in the room um, they might be looking at us. It might seem like we're the one under pressure, but the audience care more about themselves than they do about you as a speaker. You mm. are someone who is um, possibly offering them something, but it's all in the context of their lives. So that means, that's brilliant, that's brilliant news because that means we don't need to worry so much about ourselves. It's not about you as, um, as, as a speaker. 
it's through you, however. So there is something, some role. It doesn't mean you just you know kick back and and decide to to do nothing or not to prepare. Because actually, we have a huge responsibility as um, as public speakers. Because now we know that we're offering something in service of our audience, we can really um, prepare with that audience in mind and connect with them and connect with who they are. You know? And that, in doing that, two important things happen. One is that we start to prepare more um, with the audience in mind. So rather than thinking, what do I want to say? We start realizing that it's more important to think, what do they want to hear? And how can I adjust what I have to say in my material so that they understand it? Um, that's the one important thing, because that means that your talk is more likely to impress your audience. It's more likely to serve them. You'll do better. They will enjoy the whole process more. And so, you're going, so you're going from just focusing on yourself, what's going on with me, to uh, focusing on, well, here's the audience. What is it that they're needing? What's going on for, for them? And, and uh, looking at it that way? Is that? Absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So here's uh -huh. my audience. They have needs. What are their needs? Or yeah, yeah. Sense. We can uh -huh. talk some more about that if you like. And okay. the second important thing is, you know, when when you start realizing that your audience has needs and um, that it's not about you, um, you stop being so mm. nervous. Yes. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Because you you it's not about you. So. You can offer something in service of your audience. You can connect with them. Um, you can relate to them. But you don't need to worry so much. Um, you don't need to worry so much because anyway, the people on the other side of the, the lectern or the other side of the stage are going through their own process. So they come in the middle of their day or in the context of their life. Some of them will feel very open naturally to your material. Some of them will feel naturally very closed to your material. And there'll be a whole load of people in the middle who have other other feelings. So you will always get someone in the audience who loves you and connects with you. You'll always get someone in the audience who won't love you and won't connect with you. And it's not so much about you as it's about them. Hmm. So you can let go of the nerves. Uh, well, that's that's what kind of intimidates me is I see someone and it looks like they're grumpy, they're dissatisfied, and I kind of take it personal. You know, it's, it's really um, really common. And um, I, I did this a lot in my early years of training public speaking. I would see someone march into the room looking important with their suit on, and you know they would sit down and fold their arms and frown. And what I realized was that that person, um, normally, certainly in the context of, of the work I do when I'm, I'm teaching people public speaking, they come into the room like that because they are terrified. Not because they're feeling high and, and mighty, they are terrified of what I'm going to make them do. <laughs> so it's the same with many different topics, many subject matters. You know, you're, Don't forget that your subject matter might be intimidating for someone else. You know, They might feel fear around the thing that you're discussing. They might feel inadequate. They might feel like they have to show a front because if they look like they're nervous, then um, someone will judge them. So there's a whole load of stuff going on in the minds of your audience that is not about you. Um, and if it is about you, if, it, if it's directed to you, it's only relevant if you internalize it. Mm -hmm. So another good piece of advice about public speaking nerves is to realize that any criticism that comes from the audience or seems to come from the audience is only relevant to us if we believe it. Let's say, and this is the example I'm thinking of, let's say that someone in the audience stuck up their hand and said to me, Sarah, you know, I can't listen to you um, because your nose is too big. You know, you've got a huge nose. I, I'm just so distracted. I, I can't listen to you. You know, I would just find it incredibly funny because I don't have an issue with my nose. I think it's normally, normally sized. It's not too big. It's not too small. I'm not worried about it. Whereas if I was feeling a little bit, you know, I've just had a nose job or if I was feeling a little bit... Um, nervous about my appearance in some way, then that comment would crush me. Mm -hmm. So it's only if you hold that, um, that comment to be true within yourself that, um, that it has the capacity to, uh, to knock you off balance. So the stuff that comes from the audience um, is mainly, um, it's mainly possible to, to connect with using the tool of empathy and to understand that 
when we um, when we put ourselves in the shoes of our audience, the um, the stage might look very different. You know, they might be judging us in a very different way. They might be feeling towards us in a very different way to, to how and and to our subject matter than than, um, than we are. Well, when I'm in one what was one to one with someone, and then I, they they judge me, I feel judged in some way. They even give a judgment. Uh, I'll often just empathize with them and say, "Oh, I'm hearing you're feeling this experience," and I don't take it personally if I just try to empathize with them. And on one to one, it's it's easier for me to do in sense that I can have a conversation with them, you know, more of a direct conversation when it's a whole group out there. I feel less of a conversation going on than if I think the judgment. I can't. I can't hear back from them. Yeah. Often that's that's a reason, um, a difference, I suppose, between you know having a conversation or even facilitating a small group versus when you get past twenty people to two hundred people to two thousand people. You know, the more people you put in the room. Um, the more difficult it feels to to connect with them, and then for those people who for whom empathy is is super important, like you, it can feel uh, horrifying. How do I understand these people? Yeah. So, and often it's it, for for my for my groups, it's often above seven people. You know, the the seventh person is fine, but the eighth person walks into the room and oh my god, I can't deal with this. So it's it's very common. Um, and what I would say is that the process of of becoming a public speaker as opposed to a conversationalist is to um, to learn the patterns or to connect with and empathize with the patterns that many people have around your subject matter. So take um, okay. Sir Ken Robinson, the um, TED.com talk that has been viewed more than any, um, millions and millions of views. He is a man who is a conversationalist. You know, he stands on stage he doesn't march about. He's not. He's no Tony Robbins, you know. He doesn't march about barking at people and, and giving loads and loads of energy. And, and I do like Tony Robbins very much, but they're very different types of speakers. Um, but Ken Robinson's talk has been shared by by millions of people because they resonate with his style, and because they resonate with what he's saying, because he has uncovered, empathetically uncovered. People's needs or people that people's associations around education, uh, which is what his talk is about. If you haven't seen it, um, mm -hmm. and why education is so wrong. So, in empathetically connecting with his audience, he's pointing out um, truths that we all hold to be um, well to be evidence. And that's our that's the skill of a good public speaker that they know what's going on in our heads. Tony Robbins does this as well, very very well. You know, he knows at what point you're thinking what, and then when you change your mind about something, there's already something else to, to come uh -huh. in. So, so they're very attuned to their audience. They know where the audience's feelings are, and they're, and they're like you're saying, that they already know what's going on in the mind of the audience, and then they're responding to that or adding something to that. So they're, Absolutely. Uh -huh. Because they, they, they realize that their audience are a group of human beings. And this is the problem that we have. If we lose sight of our audience's humanity, we lose connection with them. And I, I'm guilty of this myself sometimes when I try to, it's often for me when I try to pack in too much information. We, we want to overgive often as, as public speakers. You know, let them not see that I'm nervous and, and please don't let them see that I, I have any gaps in my knowledge. So let me tell them everything. <laughs> and we often squeeze in all of our information, all of our knowledge into a short space of time. Now, the problem with that is that we're not then connecting in with the audience. Um, we are putting our head down, at getting our horns out and charging like a bull. And that means that we are more interested in sticking to our plan and getting through our material than putting our head up and looking around us and asking ourselves, what do these people need? Mm. The finest speakers that I've seen are able to feel what's needed in the room, to really connect with it um, and to give that. And what I've discovered is that in order to connect with the audience, you first have to connect with yourself. You, know, you have to be unwilling to just stick to the material that you've created simply because it's there. 
And that, so you're, it's really about maintaining connection, saying that what's important to me is what I'm hearing here is it's about connecting, my sense of connection uh, with the audience as well as maybe a sense of connection with yourself in terms of being able to, I call it self-empathy, which is to tune mm -hmm. into what are the feelings going on inside myself and being able to uh, be connected to those uh, as well as the kind of the empathy towards others. So holding, it's maybe more, maybe you're saying more attuned to those feelings that are going on yeah, between I yourself. Think, uh -huh. I think that's well described, Edwin, and, and um, I think it happens um, naturally the more relaxed we are, um, which of course is always the challenge with, with public speaking, but the more we're able to focus on the audience, the more we are able to let go of ourselves. So it's sort of a, a, a self-reinforcing circle that the more we say, okay, I'm all right, uh, my message will be fine, I'll be fine, I believe in what I'm saying, and this is one of the other qualities of authenticity, I believe in, in what I'm saying, I, I know that what I'm talking about is important, and then we let that go. We don't need to, to have everything right. And in that moment, we're able to have just a little bit more surplus to, to connect with others. But there's an important distinction, I think, between um, two different types of, of you, what you could call empathy, and, and here there's a really nice um, Tibetan um, kind of almost a koan, a little story that, that is told about the difference between two types of empathy, two types of compassion. Um, and it's, it's very simple. A, a man is walking along in a forest and, and he hears a shout, help, Someone, someone's in trouble. So he looks around and hears, help, help, where's this, this cry of help coming from? And, Eventually, he, he finds a big hole, and deep down at the bottom of that hole is this man crying, help, can you help me, please? It's, it's cold down here, it's dark, I, it, I'm, I'm, I think I might have broken my leg, it, it's a horrible place down here. And the man at the top looks down and says, wow, you know what, it, it's so bad for you here. It, it's, well, I, I, let me jump down there and, and be with you because it, it's so terrible for you, I don't want you to be alone. So he jumps down the hole. And of course, this is a, a very nice, cheeky little teaching for, for what we often do with, with empathy, that instead of taking people to um, you know, a place that helps them, as in bring them up the hole um, onto the surface, we, we sometimes jump down the hole. Um, and this is not this is absolutely not what I'm talking about with, with public speaking, because um, if we stay with our audience's problems, if we linger in the, the things that they find difficult, we may connect with them, but we'll be down the hole with them. So the empathy that I'm talking about is a powerful empathy. It, it means that, well, it, another one of my favorite phrases is that public speaking is an act of leadership. You know, we are taking people somewhere different. This is why it feels so powerful and why it feels so scary. So um, we are saying, no, I, I don't care if your leg's broken, we're not going to keep you down that hole. Um, here's a rope, and it might be difficult for you to pull on it, but let's go, let's come together. Um, and the speaker is, uh, is pulling and pulling and mm. bringing their audience to some new place. So empathy for me is not something soft or fluffy or um, uh, too sickly sweet. It's something that means you... Um, and giving the audience the thing that they most need in that mm. moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they need a little bit of a, a wake-up call. Uh -huh. So it, it's like it's what the first part you're saying is that if some if the audience is in distress, that you become distressed too. You you'd be going into the hole with them, and so you're yeah. saying it, the empathy is not about that, which is maybe more of a sympathetic response. It's about leadership. It's about being aware of where they are and then taking the action that kind of contributes to addressing their need, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can look at the example of, um, well, brilliant marketers of their time. I mean, um, Steve Jobs never did any market research, they say, and Henry Ford, if, if the, the saying goes that if he'd asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for faster horses, not for a Ford motor car. So we, um, we, we should connect with our audience and what they need but not um, rely on their say-so for, um, for where they need to be taken. Yeah? It, mm -hmm. It's not only about pleasing the audience, 
which we can often get into as speakers as desperate to, to please because pleasing might be more self-serving, it might be more egocentric um, than actually saying, you know what, I'm going to be the one who says something unpopular here um, because this is in service of my audience. So that, yeah, that's the type of empathy that I'm speaking about that, that has a bit of a spike to it, that has a, a bit of guts, um, but that ultimately serves to benefit the people that you're speaking to. And that's mm. the difference between a speaker who is nice and, and is able to have a very sweet conversation with you versus one who makes impact. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying it's about the, the empathy is about leadership taking some kind of a, an action and having a sense of service that you're wanting to serve uh, the audience. So it seems to be those two is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Um, did, how do you had uh, some? You said uh, on your in the article it was uh, how do my audience perceive my topic, and then you say investigate. And you had five points there uh, in your article. Is that is that kind of how you go? Let me relay my five points. <laughs> if, if you would like to, you know, go through those, if that, if you have. Well, I don't have the article in front of me. I can probably. Oh, just I can. It. I can just mention. So the first one is like uh, you say, "How do my audience perceive my topic?" And you say, "Investigate." And then the first one is, "How exciting versus snooze fest." <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, thank you for the reminder. Um, I think something that is useful to do in advance of any piece of public speaking is to get into the minds of, of your audience. Um, they're coming in to, to hear you speak, but why? And what do they think of you already? And what do they think of your topic? So that's what we were dealing with here. Um, I think it's, it's quite straightforward that um, there will be a spectrum there of is your topic the, the most exciting thing that everyone wants to, to hear about or do they have the feeling that they've heard it all before now this will determine whether your audience come in with a sense of energy already or whether you might get a folded arms and eyes down to the ground thing. One, one of my um, six month program graduates uh, was just emailing me today to say oh my goodness I had a, a shocker of a talk last night she had her first um, gig as an inspiring speaker uh, to a, an audience of um, school children and, um, and their parents and she said that the parents and the kids alike were completely unresponsive. It was supposed to be an awards night but nobody wanted to know. There, there was no interest in, in her and also um, the teacher, the head teacher uh, just said, oh here's Helen she's an inspiring speaker. That was the introduction that she got. So in oh, that wow. instance, the audience were in a place that was very defensive. <laughs> they were in a place that, that they didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't want to be there. And the trick with, a, with an audience like that is to try and figure out what their touch point is. What is it that's going to allow them to open up? What needs to be said about that environment to make everybody relax? Now, Helen didn't know because she wasn't experienced with that audience and, and this was her first time giving it a shot. Um, but, you know, it, it's useful for a speaker to have up their sleeves a number of different strategies for um, helping your audience to connect to your message. You know, first of all, it might be asking them a question about who's done this before. Ah, brilliant, you've done this before, you have some expertise, let's see if we can use that expertise if, if there's a, a moment to do so in the, in the talk. Um, or who's completely new? Okay, great. How does it feel to, to come to this? What are some words? You know, you can get your audience to interact with you. Even if it's a large audience, you can get hands up to, to have a sense of, uh, of what's going on in the room. Uh, if it's a smaller audience, you can get people to shout out words, to, to feed you with information that you can then use, mm. one, in the act of, of asking them you're connecting, and two, you can then tailor your subject matter to, um, to, to meet their expectations. If they think it's going to be boring and dull, what insight can you add? If they think it's exciting already, run with that and take them further. Well, that was, uh, yeah, then point two was, I know this versus this is new. Yeah. You had, you had five points. It was like, uh, number two is, I know this versus this is new. Number three, I want to versus I have to. Four was the piece of cake versus mind-boggling. 
And five, I want to know this, tell me, tell me, versus meh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are just different um, places that your audience might be at um, when, they, when they come to, to hear you speak. And it, there's no science about it. They're just five questions that I would ask myself instinctively now uh, as, I, as I'm preparing for a talk. But the important thing is to ask yourself some questions, you know, to, to get yourself into the mindset of that audience and to think, hey, what, what can they... Um, benefit from today? What is it that they need? And always leaving a little bit of space to be surprised, of course, because uh, sometimes you've prepared as much as you can, and someone sticks up their hand and says, oh, we've done this already, or, you know, the, the guy one hour ago was saying exactly the same thing, or they might throw a curveball completely, um, and, and that might be the thing that everyone wants to hear about. So this is the joy of public speaking, that you know, you're know you not a machine, you're not a robot, you're, and, and rightly so, you're a human being standing on stage. Um, if you leave space for the audience, you can end up in the most amazing situations with them. You can, you can end up discussing something that is fascinating that has never quite come out in that way before. Oh, so it's, uh, you're, you're leaving space for like improvisation then, so to, <laughs> yeah. in, in a sense, uh-huh. Yeah. So, well, okay. Uh, is that was uh, great? That's really given me some things to think about then, in terms of uh, applying empathy, seeing you know, connecting more with the audience, and and how to do that, and some real tools. And um, then we also have uh, your website, uh, gingerpublicspeaking.com. Is there other uh, resources that the, you're in the UK, but um, yeah. There's, there's a free Ginger Doodles e-course, Ginger being the name of my company, my aspirational future self, my little doodle character. Uh, um, you are very welcome, um, yourself and, and those listening, are very welcome to sign up for the free e-course, uh, 50 days worth of um, public speaking tips. Empathy is, is one, of the, uh, one of the weeks that we focus on. And you, you get to understand more about the other five qualities of an inspiring speaker. So I think that's a good place to, to start for people who are fresh to the world of inspiring speaking versus you know, normal mundane PowerPoint clicking speaking. Well, this has been great. Uh, so Sarah Lloyd Hughes, thank you so much for sharing your insights on how to inspire through uh, empathy for public speaking. My pleasure, Edwin. Lovely to meet you. <laughs>